Hey, welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. This is your host, Ben Pokolsky. As always, we frame our podcast around living your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. You can have that. You do deserve that. And there's many aspects that go into, one, loving your life, and two, loving your body. Today, we're going to talk to the godfather of longevity, Aubrey de Grey joins me today. And this is maybe one of the most fascinating interviews I've ever had in my entire life. So the irony of this conversation is we're actually sitting in a pub in London, England, recording it while we drink a pint of beer. So why is that so ironic? I don't drink beer. But evidently, the godfather of longevity does, and he doesn't drink water, at least so he says. He says it takes up too much space. And so I ask Aubrey about a lot of things that are typical health practices in this world, like drinking water, like getting sun exposure, like exercise. And he says it's all farce. And he believes that longevity has been solved. He understands how to cure it. And it's going to take a certain amount of time, which we talk about very specifically in this podcast. I'm so grateful for this man. If you don't know who Aubrey de Grey is, literally, he is the godfather of the longevity movement. He has defined longevity. He has created a definition as to what it is and how we're going to solve it. And he believes that within 17 years, we're no longer going to have to worry about the concept of aging. And that's a super interesting concept that we talk about a lot in this podcast. So there's definitely some pictures of us drinking beer in a a pub in London. And so if you hear some random pub noises in the background, I apologize for that, but it was an amazing conversation and super grateful for this guy's time because he's literally an absolute genius and has a tremendous amount to contribute to this world. So if you are into living a long life as a human being, you're going to enjoy this podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you once again by Fresh Pressed Olive Oil. My number one olive oil of choice, actually my number one fat of choice, probably my number one calorie of choice right now. My diet is primarily framed around a lot of meat and a lot of vegetables and a lot of olive oil and then some good old-fashioned Redmond sea salt. So the simple way to frame this is TJ literally, the owner of Fresh Press Olive Oil, flies around the world and goes to certain regions in the world where olive oils are being freshly harvested right now, finds the best farms in that region, creates a deal with them, presses the olive oil, and has it to your door within six weeks of pressing. That to me is absolutely fascinating. So you're getting the best olive oils from particular regions, whether it be South America or Europe or Australia, New Zealand, shipped straight to you in its most fresh format. And you've never tasted anything like this. So the wonderful idea behind this is TJ is going to send you, the listeners of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast, a retail size bottle, a $39 bottle for a dollar. So I highly suggest check it out. There's never a commitment. You can cancel now and forever. So just grab your $1 bottle. And if you love it, keep it going because I enjoy getting my three bottles every three months or so. You can head over to getfresh35.com and get hooked up with a $1 bottle, getfresh35.com. I hope you guys enjoy my podcast with Aubrey de Grey. If you do, listen right through to the end because there's some really great information. Have a great day. All right. Where were we? Talking about your, your role in... That's right. Yeah. So my role as chief science officer is still the same, but essentially... Because we have really good staff, you know, excellent scientists working for us, we've now got to the point where I don't have to spend much of my time doing that. I mean, you know, I'll go to lab meetings, I'll constantly be discussing with the experimentalists, you know, latest results and ideas for new work and so on. But it's not a huge time sink. Whereas the other side of my work, which has always been big, the advocacy side, you know, going on stage and on camera and on microphones like this, mm-hmm. you know, that is something that I've always viewed as part of my part of the job. But the point is, that you can't delegate it. You know, nobody, you know, the conference organisers and journalists and so on, they want the front man. Yeah. And I don't resent that at all. I mean, I I think I do a pretty good job of getting the word out, and, and the more I get a chance to do it, the better. So, yeah, I mean, I definitely really grind myself into the ground when it comes to travelling. You know, I do huge amounts of long distance travelling in order to speak to new audiences, but it's effective. Yeah. You've become the face of this human optimization. And I don't want to use the term longevity after watching your talk. And I'd love for you to actually mention why you feel like that's a bad paradigm for people to take on. Well, a 
Okay, so let me clarify this. Maybe I didn't say it quite right today. I don't think that longevity is a dirty word right. at all. I think it's fine. And in fact, over the past couple of years, what we have seen is that even the more you know, politically correct, politically sensitive constituencies, scientists who really don't want to scare anyone, are becoming happy with using the word longevity as the you know, focus of what they do. But the thing is that when one's in a conversation with somebody who's not sure whether this is really a good idea, you know, who needs to be persuaded that aging is, uh, is something we ought to be fixing, there is a huge knee-jerk reaction that almost all people of that persuasion tend to fall into, which is to presume that we are going to be extending life without extending health, which is complete nonsense. Right. It's not possible Can't to extend done. life without extending health. But one has to actually say so. You know, if you go back to the talks I would give more than a decade ago, like my TED talk, for example, I was naive back then. I didn't realize how fixated people were on that problem. So I would never actually take the trouble to emphasize this. But now I'm really aggressive about spelling out in really words of one syllable that longevity is just a side effect of health. Yeah, so you did a really good job in your talk explaining the kind of processes of ultimately longevity, what, what it looks like that to lead to ultimate demise of the human. So there's the metabolic processes and the onset of disease. Could you just explain that to us? Because you can do a much better job than I could. Sure, yeah. I mean, what you're referring to there is simply the definition that I use for aging. Yep. Aging, to me, is simply the combination of two processes, a process that goes on throughout life and a process that kicks in late in life. The lifelong process is the creation of damage as a consequence of the body's normal operation. So the body obviously is a really, really, really complicated machine. And like any machine, even simple machines, it creates various changes right. to the molecular and cellular structure of the body. And those changes accumulate over time. And the body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of that, but only a certain amount. So that's why we have the second process that kicks in late in life when the amount of this, this, these changes gets beyond what the body is set up to tolerate. And that is, the result of that is progressive decline in mental and physical function and eventually death. Mm -hmm. You did a great job of summarizing that into your seven kind of pillars almost of what it looks like within the body to age. Could you enlighten our audience on that? Yeah, right. So the, this definition of aging leads to an easy way to essentially distinguish various potential approaches for doing something about aging. In other words, for separating the way the body works, metabolism, from the eventual decline in function. And the way that is most likely to succeed is to repair damage. After it's been laid down, so we don't have to interfere with the processes that lay it down, but before it reaches this threshold level that becomes problematic. And that damage repair is something that we've been working on for 20 years now. The reason it's practical is because we can describe what types of damage need to be repaired in rather simple terms. And there's this, as you say, this classification that I came up with a long, long time ago of the various types of damage into seven major categories, for each of which there is a generic approach to doing that repair. So if you want me to go through the categories. Yeah, that's so, great. Yeah, so the first one is loss of cells, cells dying and not being automatically replaced by other cells. And that process will slow down over time. Uh, well, okay, not exactly. So, no, if a cell dies and then it gets replaced by cell division, then nothing's happened. You're back where you started. But if a cell dies and it does not get replaced, then you've got fewer cells than what you had before. And actually, if anything, that process accelerates during aging. Do we know what the cause of that is? Is it's it just yeah? Is it lack of certain things? Or? It's not necessarily doesn't necessarily have a cause. Now, the thing about aging is that it's really the result of gaps in our existing natural genetically encoded anti-aging arsenal. We're very good at not aging already. It's just that we're not perfect at not aging. Mm -hmm. So for most of our tissues, when a cell dies, it is replaced by a cell division. It's just that there are a few tissues where that doesn't happen. So the brain is an example, and neurons are not replaced. Mm -hmm. And there's one particular part of the brain called the substantia nigra, in which neurons tend to die rather rapidly, rather more rapidly than they do in other parts of the brain. 
That part of the brain is responsible for creating a chemical called dopamine, which is very important for neural function. And those cells die, as I say, quite rapidly. So all of us, by old age, have lost maybe a quarter of our dopaminergic neurons, as they're called. But different people lose these neurons at different rates. Some people have lost maybe three quarters of them by old age, and those are the people who get Parkinson's disease. So, you know, that's just one type of damage. And of course, the way to fix it, the natural way to fix it, is to put stem cells in that know what to do, to divide and differentiate into replacements for the cells that the body is not replacing on its own. So is that particular pillar in reference to telomeres as well? Is that That's not really got all that much to do with telomeres, no. I mean, of course, cells do sometimes get into a state where they commit suicide as a result of having critically short telomeres, but those tend to be cells of, a t- of types that are replaced automatically when they die. So right. this is not really related to that. All right, so um, anyway, I've only dealt with one type of damage. I'll be here all day if I <laughs> don't keep going. So the second type of damage is having too many cells of a sort that you don't want, which is kind of the, the opposite of the first type. And there's two ways in which that can happen. So one of them is if the cells are dividing when they're not supposed to, and of course that's more or less the definition of cancer, right? And there are various ways to address cancer. We've been pursuing various telomere-centric ways to try to stop cells from growing their telomeres. Other people have been looking very hard and very successfully lately at using the immune system against cancer. So there's lots of options there. The other way in which you can have too many bad cells is a bit more interesting. It involves cells not necessarily dividing inappropriately, but rather simply not dying when they are supposed to. So people often think that's a bit counterintuitive, that there should be times when cells are supposed to die. But there are. There are plenty of times like that. And this sometimes just stops happening. So cells accumulate and they're in a bad state. They're they're, um, producing toxic chemicals, for example. A big subcategory of that are what are called senescent cells, which have been in the news a lot over the past few years because researchers have succeeded in developing ways to get rid of them. And this is something that we've been seeing for a long time, of course, as well. So that's number three. So those, the first three that I've just listed are all to do with the number of cells. Either you've got too few cells that you should have more of, or you've got too many cells that are bad actors of one, one kind or another. The other four types of damage, molecular. So two of them are inside cells, things that go wrong inside cells. One of those is the accumulation of mutations in the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are these very special parts of the cell that perform the chemistry of breathing. You know, they combine nutrients with oxygen as a way to extract energy from the nutrients. And unlike any other part of the cell, mitochondria have their own DNA. It turns out this is a very bad place for DNA to be because there's toxic molecules created as a side effect of this, as a byproduct of this um, breathing thing, and those molecules damage DNA. So, yeah, so what happens is that the mitochondrial DNA accumulates mutations much, much faster than any uh, than the nuclear DNA, the regular chromosomes that we have. So we've been pursuing an approach that essentially puts the mitochondrial DNA copies of, backup copies of it into the nucleus, modified in such a way that it still works even though it's in the wrong place. This is an idea that predated me by some, de- some, some by a decade probably, but people gave up on it and we have picked it up and we've pretty much, we've mostly got it working now. The next type of damage inside the cell is simply waste products, just garbage that accumulates. That happens because there are lots and lots of byproducts of metabolic processes that are created all the time. Most of them can be destroyed as they're created, but some of them are just too gnarly and that we don't have them. Is it a long list or a short list? It's pretty long, actually. Is any um, few that come to mind? Yes, yes. Yeah. So the number one killer in the Western world, atherosclerosis, is an example of this. It's caused because there's a type of oxidized cholesterol that we can't destroy. Right. So, you know, that essentially poisons the white blood cells in the arteries, the major artery walls, and eventually they become inflamed. Is that and a name? Yes, it does. It's called 7-keto cholesterol. Okay. There are other types of oxidized cholesterol that also accumulate, but 7-KC is the one that people believe is likely to be the public enemy number one. And is that a result of particular environmental influences or physical influences or nutrition, or, or is it just a natural byproduct in everybody... Everybody so gets it, is, it yeah. There may, be, there may be nutritional and other ways to slightly modulate the rate, the rate at which this comes into existence and the rate at which it accumulates, but no, you can't avoid it. It's because it's just a, I mean, everyone has cholesterol, cholesterol itself, but a regular cholesterol is an essential molecule, and, you know, everyone's got about the same amount of it. So 
and the formation of 7KC is a spontaneous event that happens just because of free radicals and so on that you know, are just going to exist. Yep. All right, so yes, yeah, so the way that we have developed that gets rid of this stuff is to identify other species, especially bacteria, which already have enzymes that can break these things down. And it works. You know, we've been able to develop enzymes that we can put you know, the genes for those enzymes into human cells, and the human cells don't get those problems. We've done also the same thing for macular degeneration, which is, of course, the number one cause of blindness in the elderly. There, it's nothing to do with cholesterol. It's a completely different molecule, actually a derivative of vitamin A, but same strategy worked. We so found all these things are currently in. happening in people to... Okay. Yeah, I mean, the vitamin A one was spun out into a company a few years ago. They've obviously been moving it forward through mouse studies and so on, and that should be in clinical trials next year. So that's all good. All right, then, so I've got two types of damage that I haven't yet got to. First one is, again, waste products, but this time outside the cell, in the spaces between cells. This is an important distinction simply because outside the cell, the natural machinery that we have for getting rid of stuff, for breaking stuff down, is very primitive, far less sophisticated than what exists inside the cell. Which means that actually the stuff that accumulates, because it's not being destroyed, is in fact quite easy to destroy. It would be toast already if it were inside the cell. So all we have to do is get it inside. And the way to do that is essentially to vaccinate against it, to use the immune system to engulf it. And, th and that's been shown to work. Can you give me some examples of what that would be, these, these waste sure. products we're familiar with? Sure. Most of them come under the category of amyloid. So in Alzheimer's disease, as many people know, there are two types of waste product that accumulate. One of them inside the cell, those are called tangles, and we're, we have a project working on them right now. But the other one are called plucks, and they accumulate in the spaces between the neurons in the brain. So it's, it works. Basically, 20 years ago, people started to test the idea of vaccinating against this stuff in mice and they're going to work pretty easily. It took a bit of a while for people to get the same thing working in humans, but now it does. There are four or five different vaccines now. So literally what you would think of a normal vaccine, like you're putting a needle in you and it's, it's going to prepare the body to get rid of this. That's right. Now, it doesn't have much effect on cognition, but that's not a surprise because we know that Alzheimer's is a very multifactorial phenomenon and so you've got to fix a bunch of other things as well. But it's very good to have this in our back pocket to get rid of amyloid. And we've been funding work to get rid of other types of amyloid in other tissues, not the brain. In particular, there's one that accumulates badly in the heart and seems to be a very important source of death in centenarians. We were able to get that far enough along so that it was again able to be spun out as a, as a private company fairly recently. Yeah, how are those amyloids slowing down the cell or impacting the cell so much that it's leading to potential demise? Well, the mechanism of toxicity of amyloid is still, well, first of all, it's, it's still a research area, but also it's probably different in different tissues. So in the brain, there is a debate as to whether accumulation of plaques of amyloid in, the, in Alzheimer's disease really makes much of a contribution at all. Indeed, it may very well be that the formation of the plaques is a protection to kind of sequester and effectively reduce the surface-to-volume ratio of misfolded single molecules of amyloid that are floating around and causing problems of their own right. But that still means that it would be good to remove the plaques because the more you remove, the more capacity there is to aggregate some more, so to speak, to, get, to lower the concentration of the soluble stuff. Right. And it may be the same in other tissues, but in the heart, this different type of amyloid called transthyrosine amyloid, which may actually simply be having mechanical issues. Obviously, the heart is this really you know, important muscle that needs to have very robust mechanical connections between the individual heart cells, the individual cardiomyocytes. And there's reasonable evidence that, that amyloid disrupts that and contributes to heart failure in very late life. All right, and the final part of damage is cross-linking. So some of our tissues need to be elastic in order to work. The most important one is our major arteries, which of course have to buffer the constantly pulsating blood pressure from the heartbeat. And if that doesn't happen, then it takes more energy to push the blood around and you, need, you get higher blood pressure and that causes damage in the kidneys and everywhere else, right? So, yeah, that elasticity is really vital and it goes away because of chemical reactions between the molecules of the artery wall, what's called the extracellular matrix, and sugar in the blood. 
these chemical reactions are relatively rare, but they accumulate over time, and they cause new chemical bonds to be laid down between the molecules of the extracellular matrix. And the chemistry of this has been pretty well understood for a long time, but nobody's been able to figure out what to do about it. So we have been pursuing this for quite a while, and the result is, yeah, we basically cracked it. We, first of all, had to do a rather counterintuitive thing, which was actually to figure out ways to make these cross-links rather than break them, just in order to have enough material to experiment on. But that was successful. And now we've got enzymes that can break these links, and we think we've got it close to a therapy. Can you talk first about how you created them? Because that's interesting to me. Like, what was the things that you were doing directly? I mean, was it just injection of a particular molecule, or was it actually like... Uh, it's, no, it's a purely chemical reaction. So... There's one particular type of chemical structure that forms these links that's more abundant than all the others, and that's why it's the main focus. It's called glucosapane, and it's formed in, uh, obviously, naturally in the body. That's, what, that's the problem we're trying to address. But if you want to actually study it and work out how to break it down and so on, then you need a fair amount of it. So how would you get that? One way would be to take old arteries, okay, and just break them down in the, you know, in the lab and, you know, strip away all of the other bits of protein and so on, and you end up with your glucosapane. People can do that, but the technique for doing it is extremely laborious and you end up only with really trace amounts of the stuff. So it's not practical. And if you couldn't do that, then there's lots of other things you can't do, like, for example, raising antibodies against the stuff. So... What the group that we funded at Yale University were able to do was to develop a chemical reaction that starts with amino acids in a test tube and does a sequence of things and you end up with, with this thing, glucosapane. In, and it, it's, the process they developed is very efficient, so you can make grams of this stuff for pennies, where it's, you know, that would, that's many orders of magnitude better than before. And the result was exactly as predicted. In other words, you know, it was very straightforward from there to raise antibodies to the stuff and also to identify enzymes in bacteria that were able to break the thing down. So that's where we are right now and that work is moving forward again as a new company and we're hopeful that that will be in clinical trials fairly soon. So is this company, so the pub, this process wouldn't yet be released to the public Correct. due to the fact that it's still in the development stage of the business? Correct. Yeah, but you feel like you've more or less crack this code around uh, atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, yes. Okay, what, what I was talking about just then for the cross-linking, that's not atherosclerosis, that's arteriosclerosis, so hardening of the arteries. Atherosclerosis is the accumulation of fat, sure. fatty deposits, and that was all to do with cholesterol. So that's nothing to do with glucosapane. But so, but arteriosclerosis, then. Yeah. So that's a huge concern, right? Because sure. so many people are dying on a yearly basis with that. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, all of these things are huge killers, right? So, I mean, they're big parts of aging. So you've listed out seven, and I think it's important that the audience acknowledge, or maybe you acknowledge, that there's no hierarchy in your mind. They're all Correct. Just Very important to understand this, yes, that all of these types of damage are accumulating simultaneously in our bodies throughout life, and the rates at which they accumulate are essentially dictated by evolution. You know, we have natural selection to develop genes, enzymes, that will minimize the rate but they're all going to kill us, right. so the selective pressure ends up leveling them all out. So they each lead to you know, ill health at about the same age, which means that if we fix most of these types of damage, but not all of them, then we'll still die on schedule, more or less. Right. Do you have a team within your group working on the DNA predispositions, so looking at when you have this gene, it's contributing to this? Not really, no. And the reason we don't is because, actually, the predispositions, I mean, except for very rare variants, of course, the, the predispositions don't make all that much difference. Really? They, of course, do. I mean, of course, different people die of different things, right? So we know that there's some differences between people, but not very much. It really comes down to relatively small differences in the rate of accumulation of different types of damage. Now, most people who die of cancer have some level of atherosclerosis as well. It's just that the cancer got them first, and vice versa. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'll take it since approach is to repair damage, that means that it kind of doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't have to be personalized. I mean, of course, different people may need different therapies slightly more often or slightly more thoroughly as a, on account of this genetic predisposition, but only slightly. And in practice, it may end up not even being worth finding that out. It may actually be more cost-effective simply to give everybody all the therapies 
all the time. And, you know, maybe you're giving people some of the therapies twice as often as they need them, but that's not much of a problem. And it saves you all the effort of figuring out which people need which therapies. Right. So my brain goes straight to you know, what are the things that we're doing on a day-to-day basis that are contributing to accelerating these things? And then the opposite of that, what are the things we can do to slow them down? But you mentioned in your talk that you're, you and your team may not be working on dietary and, and lifestyle interventions. You're just trying to identify the biochemical pathways? Well, not than identify them, but to disrupt them as well, right? right. Or to, uh, to, to outrun them. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, the Health Optimization Summit is all about lifestyles and biohacking and so on. And so, I mean, I don't want to be too down on this. It's certainly important to at least, you know, do what your mother told you and, you know, not get not smoke, obviously, not get seriously overweight, have a reasonably varied diet so you don't get short of micronutrients. But beyond that, you know, every little helps, sure. I mean, uh, the thing I always have to, uh, the reason I have to emphasize this is simply because people tend to run with this too much. They tend to get into a, an idea that if they just get really conscientious about their lifestyle and diet and so on, they don't have to worry about tedious medicine. But that's not true. You know, the fact is, the maximum that you can achieve by whatever we can do today in terms of lifestyle and diet and such like is far less than what we actually want. You might get a few years if you're lucky, if you get it just right for you, but and I'm not knocking that, you know, every day is worth having, but we mustn't be focusing on this at the expense of focusing on developing medicines that will make the whole thing unnecessary. Right. And, you know, of course, I mean, I wouldn't have been asked to speak at this conference if Tim didn't understand that, right? So, I mean, it's not, I'm not in any way criticizing. I think that one just has to have this balance and to explain this balance. All right. Do you think we're going to be, or you're going to, and your team are going to be able to crack this code of all seven pillars within your lifetime? We're pretty much there. You know, I mean, several of these pillars are far enough along now that we don't work on them anymore because everything that needs to be done has been spun out into the private sector. And the ones that have not got that far are probably within only a few years of getting to that point. You know, I can genuinely see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, with the point where we might end up being able to kind of declare victory and just become an outreach and education organization. Now, in terms of what that means for the rest of the process, no, that remains to be seen. But I mean, the steps are pretty much the same steps that one would see in any other clinical setting. So, so you've got to get the thing from proof of concept through to the beginning of the clinical trial, then the clinical trial has to actually be done, right, and has to succeed. And then we do have this extra step, which is, of course, that eventually we've got to combine all of these therapies and give them to the same people at the same time and see what the result of that is. So there's a long way to go. And if we want to put a time frame on it, then I think... Well, I, I always i am very careful to be probabilistic about this and say, well, we have a 50-50 chance of achieving such a milestone by such and such a date. At the moment, I think that the 50-50 for getting all the way, getting to what I've called longevity escape velocity, where we are postponing health problems faster than time is passing, that's about 17 years away now. But it might be faster. Of course, it might be a lot longer. You know, I always accept that there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for 100 years. All right, so when you say that, and then on stage you also said that you think people are unrealistic in thinking they're going to double their lifespan. Where's the breakdown? Uh, like, uh, what, uh. what are the breakdowns? Well, I said on stage was that I think it's unrealistic to suggest that we can double lifespan with interventions that already Got exist. It. Got it. I do, however, think that given this 50-50 of 17 years, that most people alive today are likely to benefit from therapies that that we're working on and are likely to be able to avoid the health problems of late life however long they live which means of course that on average they're going to live a long time the beauty of that is it's not as you say just lifespan it's health span and that's the kind of the issue you brought up in the beginning with people chasing longevity is is we have this belief that if we live too long the population of the earth is going to exceed what we can carry and that creates a whole different subset of problems but you're not just optimizing for longevity you're optimizing for quality of life and how do you feel that looks in 
25 and 50 years? Like, are we going to be able to maintain our aesthetics and, and vigor of our 20s and 30s? Oh, God, yes. I mean, you know, first of all, let's talk about looks. So, I mean, the outside of the body is the easy part. Sure. The skin is a pretty good regenerative tissue. And the only reason that the skin goes downhill late in life is because it is being more and more powerfully poisoned by the inside of the body. Right. So, uh, if we fix the inside, then the outside pretty much looks after itself. And, yeah, I mean, the same with everything, you know, with strength, with, you know, cognitive function. You know, we really are talking about the entire shebang. Solving these seven obstacles or... I don't want to call them obstacles, but we'll call them your pillars. Mm-hmm. What does that look like for lifespan in your eyes, right? So if it's not unreasonable to think we're going to double our lifespan, do you have any idea of what would be the end breaking point, or is it just ultimately immortality? Well, I don't like to use the word immortality. It's taken, it's, it's you know, it has religious connotations. Yeah. But yes, there absolutely is no reason to believe that there would be any limit on how well we could how much we could extend longevity, healthy longevity and therefore total longevity once we got this going. Damage repair is like that. I mean, I like to use, as you know, the analogy of a car. And, you know, vintage cars today, cars that are more than 100 years old, those cars got that way because of comprehensive preventative maintenance. They were not designed to last that long. They were designed to last maybe 10 or 15 years. And if you'd asked the manufacturers 100 years ago whether any of their cars were going to last 100 years, they'd have laughed at you. But now, when we've done it, you know, you ask people whether a car that's now 100 years old is likely to be in the same condition 100 years in the future, they'll say, well, of course it will, because we know how to do that. So, yeah, there's definitely going to be no limit. Absolutely fascinating. As far as interventions, we're sitting here in a pub drinking a, drinking a pint of wa- a beer. Are the things people doing on a day-to-day basis, and I know this is a loaded question, but... Is it futile? Like, is it just a matter of like, hey, just wait for these therapies, make as much money as you can so you can afford them faster <coughs> than everybody else? And, and well, the way I look at that is, number one, it's horrifying to me that people are always looking at this only around their own situation. I, mean, I do not get out of bed in the morning because I think that my work is going to increase my chances right. of making the cut, so to speak. I mean, yes, it is increasing the chances, but it's increasing them by a pretty modest factor. I mean, I, mean, I think you know, my entire career has probably added 5% to my chances of doing that. So, and that's true for any, whether you're doing it for yourself or whether you're doing it for your spouse or your mother or whatever. Whereas, if one's doing it for the whole of humanity, then the numbers come out rather different. You know, every single day that I bring forward the defeat of aging, I'm saving 100,000 lives. You know, that's a serious amount of motivation to get out of bed so that's the first thing but also of course if you are thinking about yourself then it depends how old you are if you're in your 20s now then I cannot really deny that you're probably just going to make it whether you try hard or not and if you're in your 80s now I cannot deny that you're probably not going to make it but so what you know (laughs) You're still going to you're still going to be changing your probability of making it by somewhat. It's just that you know it's people in their maybe 40s or 50s who are on, who are going to change it by the greatest amount because they're right on the cusp. Right. You brought up seven keto cholesterol. Do you have any uh, recommendations for the listeners to maybe not subject themselves to that or potentially alter it once they've got it? No. no. I mean, basically, you know, it is a chemical that is going to come into existence in your body, whatever you do. Now, of course, different people have different predispositions to... Now, some people need to, need to be more careful than others about what they eat so as not to get atherosclerosis. But that's not specific to 7 keto cholesterol. It's just like, you know, I don't have anything to add to general medical advice on that. All right. So through your 25 years plus now of, of studying this health optimization longevity realm, what are the aspects or modalities that you're most excited about obviously you're going to you're going to solve all of these things but is there anything that stands out in your mind is like yeah i did this and this was really really got me really enthusiastic yeah it's hard to know i mean obviously i am very proud of what has been achieved over these 20 years you know we've come a long way and i believe that um you know looking back we could say that the advocacy efforts and the scientific efforts that i've put in have made a significant contribution But, no, I really wouldn't want to pick out any individual thing. You know, today, for example, I put up a slide showing, I think, four of the papers that we've published over the past few years. And I picked those four just because they are particular highlights of breakthroughs that we made 
in areas that people had just given up on. And so one of them was enzymes to break down seven keto cholesterol. Since you were talking about that, so that's all. That's all great. But I wouldn't want to. You know, I mean, out of those four, I wouldn't want to rank them. For example, right. So in this health space, we have all these beliefs around what we need to be doing for you know, optimization of human function and ultimately living as long as we can. What are the ones you think that are the biggest myths that we're following? Like, for example, I was drinking a pint and not a glass of water. I don't want to generalize too much because, of course, everyone's different. You know, some people have better alcohol tolerance than others. Some people, I mean, I can, I'm one of those lucky people. I can eat and drink exactly what I like and nothing happens. You know, um, obviously, you know, a lot of people who drink beer a lot would put on weight and I right. don't. So it's always different for different people. Myths, though, I mean, well, I mean, I think certainly a lot of people have an overly optimistic idea of the extent to which supplements can benefit them. And they also have an overly pessimistic idea of the extent to which food or other lifestyle things can harm them. So, I mean, I think there's far too much scare stories about you know, living next to cell phone towers, for example. At the end of the day, the overwhelming majority of the overwhelmingly most important determinants of the rate of aging are not negotiable. I mean, the single worst thing that you're doing right now for your life is breathing. Yeah, yeah right? But it's, you know, you can't, you can't not do it, really. Right. Maybe you could slow it down? Not really, no. no. Breathing, you got to do. So now, is there anything you're looking at, or do these seven pillars cover the brain? So I'm looking at, you know, mindset and neurotransmitters and hormones and how those are impacting the brain and... Would those all be within the realm of what you are speaking of? They certainly would, yes. So the brain is, you know, it, it's a really important organ. Mm -hmm. But the point is, it's made of more or less the same stuff as the rest of the body. You know, it's made of cells and stuff between cells. And the cells are made of the same stuff, you know, DNA and proteins and so on. So, yeah, the types of damage that accumulate in the brain are exactly the same as in the rest of the body. I mean, the, the specifics may be different, like the, different, uh, the amyloid in the brain sure. Alzheimer's is a, from a different protein than the amyloid in the heart, but it's still the same basic problem with the same basic solution. Yeah, I'm just looking at whether, you know, this idea of optimization of mindset actually plays, plays in. Like oh, well, mindset's a different thing. So, yes, absolutely. We have known for decades, of course, that stress is bad for aging, that you know, when you are in a stressful situation, you have elevated levels of certain hormones that mess things up and accelerate the rate at which certain types of damage are going to accumulate. And, you know, if we look at centenarians, people have obviously been studying centenarians for a long time, trying to figure out what makes them special, how they get to be able to live exceptionally long. And it's been quite frustrating because they basically have nothing in common. You know, some centenarians are overweight, some of them smoke and so on. There's just one thing that pretty much all centenarians do have in common, which is nothing bothers them. They haven't necessarily all had a stress-free life, but when they get into stressful situations, they know how to handle that stress. And so they don't have this, this problem. Absolutely fascinating. So what does the next 12 to 24 months look like for you? I'll just throw that general question out there rather than guiding it. Yeah, there's no real answer to that. I mean, I've been doing pretty much the same thing for a long time now, just getting out there, um, getting the word out, and I guess I'm going to carry on doing that for at least another few years. Yeah. And also, of course, the foundation is going to continue to pump out the most impactful research that we possibly can. So nothing's really going to change. But of course, at the level of individual projects, we're going to have breakthroughs. You know, from my point of view at the coalface, where I'm looking at the details of the science all the time, then, you know, it's not, you know, pretty much no week goes by without my being happy about something. <laughs> right? That's great. But, you know, it, it's all little steps. I couldn't imagine how rewarding it is to get up in the morning, right? Like, I'm making such a small impact in the world and I get up feeling like invigorated every day and I can't imagine what it would feel like to literally feel like you're changing the face of humanity. Well, <laughs> interesting way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think about it a lot. I'm not the kind of person who needs to like constantly reflect on how important sure. what I'm doing is. But sometimes it pulls you out of bed, I'm sure. You're like well, I mean, you're invigorated. I mean, yeah, I feel invigorated all the time. I mean, certainly one thing that it's a big deal. It's, you know, people just come up to me in the street all the time and just say that they really, they thank me for the work I do. And that really, you know, <laughs> that's quite a big thing. So 
What that means is the flip side is I look at my team, you know, the foot soldiers who are not on television every day. Now, they work every bit as hard as me. They're just as committed and so on. And they don't get any of this adulation. So I really look up to them because without them, this couldn't be happening. Amazing. Do you, now, living in Southern California, do you have any, um, or maybe Northern California, I guess, do you have any ancestral practices? Like, do you, you know, make a point to ground? Do you make a point to get outside the sunshine like all these people are speaking of? Or is it just kind of a, a non-issue for you? I don't even know what you just said. <laughs> Interesting. So everyone, you know, everyone's talking about this health optimization. You have to just live in almost an ancestral way, right? This idea that the human body is evolved to do this, therefore you have to get the proper spectrum of light and the proper exposure to the elements, completely just not even on your radar. No. Fascinating. I think when you have the power of knowledge that you've got and you see the, end, the light at the end of the tunnel, it kind of eliminates that all for you, right? You're like, oh, all that stuff doesn't matter. I know I'm going to know I'm going to achieve this. But for the average person, if that's maybe even occupies their mind in the short time or lets them know they're doing something well to maybe make, to get on, you know, ultimately get on Noah's Ark that you're creating, that's a pretty cool uh, sure. belief. And maybe it's a psychological optimization, the whole mindset. Yeah, and I'm fine with that. Yeah, very, very interesting. Aubrey, I'm so grateful for you and, and so are all my listeners and uh, grateful for your time and for sharing a pint. <laughs> you're very kind. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. All right, ladies and gents, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Aubrey de Grey. As I said, I wouldn't let you down. There's some fascinating stuff going on in there. He's an absolute brilliant wealth of information. And I really kind of had to try to keep bringing it back down to earth because I know he gets really, really complex. Hopefully you guys got a lot of this conversation. Longevity is really something that hits home with all of us at some point, right? If you're under 35, and this is extremely subjective, you typically don't think about your mortality. At some point in your life, you're going to become aware of the fact that you are not going to live forever. And this is where this stuff comes in. You know, prior to my 35th birthday or some subjective time around then, I really didn't think about anything other than, hey, I just want to live my life and enjoy every moment. And at some point you're like, oh, I'm not going to live forever. I should probably start implementing some things that are going to keep death at arm's length. And that's really what this conversation is about. I ultimately would love to live forever, but at very least, I want to keep it at arm's length because I love my life. I want to enjoy every moment that I'm here. But at the same time, let's stay here for a long time. So I hope you guys love the podcast. If you did, share it with one person you know and love. Leave us a review. As always, we do appreciate it. Leave us a good review, of course. Why wouldn't you, right? Fresh press olive oil. Get fresh. Get fresh. Three, five. G-E-T-F-R-E. S-H, the number three, the number five dot com for a dollar bottle of olive oil. And this might be your last chance to grab it because this stuff doesn't come around all the time, guys. So don't miss this opportunity. They only do this three times a year. And once the olive oil is gone, it's gone. It's not coming again until much later. So I hope you guys have had a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. And I look forward to connecting with each and every one of you guys on social media. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.